So I'm going to start my talk with a confession, which is that I am possibly the least likely person on the planet to have become a fish expert. Most of the folks in my space have PhDs in marine biology. Me, I didn't see the ocean for the first time until I was 18, because I grew up in the Midwest and we have lakes. Why would you go to the ocean? <laughs> I am deathly allergic to shellfish. And over the last four years working on this project, my most frequent prayer has been, dear God, please don't let me barf on this fisherman's boat. <laughs> I hate snorkeling. It makes me hyperventilate in a really weird way. It's not fun. So this is me outside my comfort zone. The photo on your right is me learning to head, gut, and fillet a fish for the first time. I think my expression says it all. <laughs> and the one next to that is actually on an island off the coast of China when we did some anthropological observation. We're in a fish factory, which is why I'm all kitted out. And this is about 10 minutes after, at the outside of the factory, our Chinese translator quit because he pointed at the factory and said, I'm not going in there. It's going to smell really bad. <laughs> so I'm not a marine biologist. I'm also not a designer. So I thought it might be helpful to at least put in context how I think about design process as we try to engage in this big work of systems change. So if you hang out with people like me who are trying to tackle big social and environmental problems, there's lots of different disciplines and, and spaces where they borrow ideas, lots of strategies for how you might move a system. So these are some of them. Collective impact, systems thinking, social labs, design process. And I would say most of the folks who are in my sphere think of these as parts of a toolkit. And each of them is just a different tool that you might use. And I'd say I think about it like this, which is all of those tools that are out there and those strategies are really just prototypes for how we think we can drive systems change. Nobody really has any pat answers now. And so we are in the process of actually designing and refining and iterating those processes as we go. And there are times when I'm borrowing a little bit more heavily from systems thinking than from design, but it's always held in this container of constant iteration, which is exhausting. So I'm not going to touch on all of those areas today, but the three that I do want to touch on are how we use design process for the what, so identifying targets for the change. For the how, which is what do you build to actually accomplish that? And then finally, who, meaning how does this design process start to apply internally? So first, the what. In my world, when we talk about the what of a system, we're actually talking about a theory of change. It's sort of, how can you look out on a system and say, if I do this, then I think this consequence will happen, and hopefully not that unintended consequence. How do you start to come up with this idea of how you're going to move things? I should uh, stop with uh, the systems design stuff and dive a little bit more into the fish world so you know exactly the problem that we're tackling here. So this illustration will give you the general gist of things, which is a past of abundance, less abundance now, and a future of mostly jellyfish. Over 90% of the world's fisheries are heavily overfished or fished at maximum capacity. We're not only taking too much, we're also wasting a good chunk of what we actually have. So for every four tons of fish that are landed, that are eventually making it hopefully to someone's plate, there's one ton of bycatch. So we land about 90 million metric tons a year of wild fish. That leaves us somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million tons of bycatch of sea turtles, birds, other fish, dolphins, coral, all that gets thrown away. We actually don't even know the full scope of the problem because we've measured and assessed about 375 fisheries. There are thousands of fisheries in the world, but assessing a fishery requires marine scientists and capacity and money. So I'm in this space in part because I fell in love with complex problems. I'm also in it because I got an invitation. When I was working as an analyst, I sat down with a program officer at a foundation um, over drinks at the Clift Hotel, um, and she asked me, in our marine science program, are there entrepreneurs or, or organizations that we should be funding that we aren't funding? Any solutions out there that we should be funding that we're not? And I think maybe inspired by my second cocktail of the evening, I said, um, that's a great question. Another one is, what if the thing you really need to be funding doesn't exist? A, how would you know that? And then B, what would you do about it? And she said, that's a great question. You tell me. Get me a proposal tomorrow. So the next day, I sat down and put together an idea that included the analysis I had been doing for the nonprofit where I worked, which helped map a landscape of, or an ecosystem of solutions and decide what's missing from that, what could actually add to the collective effect of all those solutions, and couple that with a design process. So the idea was, we'll figure out what's missing, 
and then we'll go invent it. And my boss didn't even review the proposal because he thought it was such a crazy idea. So it was that much more fun to call him after she reviewed it and said yes. <laughs> so that first part of the process, identifying the holes, the hole that we identified was this part of the process, which is fish processing. So processing and distribution is the middle of the supply chain. And no one had been talking to these folks about sustainability. And there weren't any incentives that were being aligned for them around those making changes in behavior. So we decided to look at that part of the equation. And we sent anthropologists to eight different sites in the world, four different continents, looking at fish change hands between the middle of the supply chain and the other ends. We were looking for what drives the day-to-day -day activities of the seafood industry. Here's a little bit of what we found. We show up at this fish distribution center in North America, sales of upwards of $100 million annually, and watch them sell fish. This is what it looks like. The sales manager takes an Excel spreadsheet and emails that out to the regional sales reps, who then all get on the phone and call their local customers and sell fish. None of them check in with each other during the day or send information back to home base. So very predictably, at the end of the day, you have some categories of fish that are oversold, and some that are undersold. And so at the end of the day, the sales manager has to figure out how he's going to make that work. And here's what it sounds like. They call up a customer and they say, you know, the truck actually broke down today for that particular producer. Um, so we don't have any of that fish, but I have this other kind that cooks up really similarly. Or, you know, I know you said you wanted that oyster, but honestly, I haven't been that excited about the quality from that farm lately. So I think I'm going to I'm, I'm put in these instead and I'll knock $5 off the box. So it's this very complex human interaction around negotiating you out of what you ordered. That's the benign side of the equation. The darker side is that once you take a skin off a fish, most chefs can't tell the difference. So right now, the fraud and mislabeling rate on seafood in North America is upwards of 30%. Red snapper is only red snapper 12% of the time. And if you eat in a sushi restaurant, the fraud rates are upwards of 70%. And that tends to start here, because if you have to make a mismatch of demand and supply work by changing what the fish is, it's easier to change the label than to do that workaround. But that workaround and that issue of fraud is actually also the reason why there's a cultural resistance to technology. Because if you're going to do fish in and fish out and track it very carefully, then you also can't commit fraud. So there's a reason why fish is still sold on the phone. The other thing we noticed here that was important was that the time horizon for the seafood industry is one day. It's such a perishable commodity, and there's so much energy focused on getting it out the door, in part because of this mismatch. So the ocean brings up what it brings up. We all want the same five fish every single day, and the middle of the chain gets caught in that crunch. The problem with this being the time frame of the whole industry is that that cuts off innovation. If you want to be innovative, you have to actually be thinking about how you're going to do things differently a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, seven years from now, when the fish that you are dependent on as a business are starting to go away. So some of these insights that we saw, system rules are rigged against innovation, demand bullies supply, innovators are stranded. So we found plenty of folks who were entrepreneurs working in the space or folks who had ideas, and they were stranded at this level of very small interactions. We also got our levers from this, fish and story. Story meaning a narrative, but also just data. And we needed to figure out how we could get data and fish paired, get them to marry up through the system so that they were all the way through. You thought you were going to make it through this conference without seeing one of these. <laughs> so one of the difficulties with our project was that we didn't have one user. We had all kinds of users, right? Users of the whole system. So it was throwing in fishermen and fish processors and a bunch of other different places in the, in the supply chain into one analysis. And so what we decided to do is take a look at what's the disposition toward change. And we graph that by looking at big picture, I understand I'm part of a whole, I understand there's a system that, of which I am one piece, versus transactional point of view. So I'm focused on doing day-to-day -day business, getting paid every day. And then bending towards status quo, I'm happy the way things are. Or next generation, I'm actually looking for what is the next way that we can sell fish more efficiently, we can preserve our oceans, or we can even think about just better technology. So in that um, scenario, we ended up with four different quadrants, different types of folks. Entrepreneurs are up in this upper right-hand corner, the catalysts. Counselors and conduits wind up being within the status quo within companies. 
Compliers are typically fishermen or other folks who are so bullied by the system that they are resigned. Just give me the rules. And the thing that was most interesting to us was that if you looked at those sides of the equation, you had, on the one hand, entrepreneurs and innovators who had great story. They had data, they had a message, they had something that could actually be used to shift behavior and was also relevant and valuable to the supply chain. And on the other hand, they had no platform. The folks who had platform were on the other side, established companies, and they didn't have any story. And you kind of need both to drive change. So that gave us some kind of idea of like, all right, so we need these players to interact in different ways. We need for them to come to each other, not as enemies or as outsider insider, but we need to have to craft a space where they can actually see the value of what the other brings to the table. So, okay, great, we got our levers. We got a bunch of activities and actions we'd like to see happen. Um, how does that actually turn into an idea or a business or anything that would functionally accomplish that? So here was where the design team completely split into tribes, I would say. We had a big argument going on between folks who wanted to, la to launch one business that would tackle one aspect of this problem, and then folks who said, you know what, we don't need to make the bike, we need to make the machine that makes the bike, right? So we actually need to build a platform that will churn out solutions, not just come up with one solution. Because the whole thing we've been fighting this whole way is that one solution biting off one piece of this very complex problem isn't enough. I don't recommend the way that we handled this for any future project. It pretty much dissolved into acrimony. The winner of the debate was pretty much just the folks who were the stubbornest the longest. And we ended up deciding to build the machine and not just the one piece. So Future of Fish, the idea was born. And it was, at the time, a pretty messy concept. It was part incubator for new ventures, part consulting firm for innovation, and part um, collaborative platform for people who are already in the space. And we got a little bit of seed funding for about three months to test the idea of pulling people together in collaboration. And then we went into a phase that I like to call 20 months of suck. <laughs> we ended up during that next 20 months trying out about three different business models and about four different strategies for engaging the seafood industry. And we initially got great response to our call and um, had people show up for a, for a workshop, all wanted to work together. And some of them, their companies weren't mature enough to work together yet. Some of them, they weren't going to fit together. They were sort of not the right people in the room kind of issue. We were constantly fighting this, this problem and this challenge of everybody thinks it's a great idea for entrepreneurs who are mission-driven to be incubated. So to have a great safe space, potentially get some funding, and get out into the world. And nobody wants to pay for it. We, for a while, were getting our clients, the entrepreneurs, to pay for it um, by giving us shared revenue. We talked about equity with some of our entrepreneurs. One of the big issues is that a lot of businesses in the, in the seafood industry are family-owned companies. They're not going to do an IPO at any point. So a lot of the models that are used in the tech industry or have been ported over to the social side for business incubation, we tried a lot of them, and they just don't simply work. Our big insight came at the point when we realized the person we think is our client is not really our client. And the product that we think is our product is not really our product. <laughs> so essentially, we had been working with entrepreneurs as clients. And it turned out they weren't. They were actually a vehicle to deliver the change. And they were important and they were a stakeholder, but they weren't actually going to be our paying client. And our product was not going to be incubation for entrepreneurs. It was going to be this change process that basically this idea that we had of discovering a new way of framing a problem and where there are holes, co-designing with entrepreneurs what that solution might look like, and then holding these entrepreneurs working together for over time was a repeatable process. And that there were people like impact investors and foundations who were interested in that as a product. So we now have various levels of products and services at each of these phases of change. And the elegant thing about it is that we meet new entrepreneurs where the Red X starts, and we're in relationship with them through those next two phases. And in many cases, that winds up being almost three years. So what we have is that we've found and stumbled upon a different model for incubation. The typical model is what I like to call drinking from the fire hose, which is the six-week boot camp where you show up as an entrepreneur and they just blow information at you about all the different phases of entrepreneurship, most of which, which isn't relevant to where you are at that moment in time. After that six weeks, you've given away 10% of the equity of your company, and then you go off and try to be successful, and good luck and fairly well. And our system winds up looking like slow drip irrigation. 
We do very light touch business advisory services for the whole time that our entrepreneurs are around. It's very custom, but not very deep. And as a result, we wind up being able to be there for them when they actually have a crisis, as opposed to just helping them put together a slide deck. So today we have a number of pods that are functioning that are full of entrepreneurs. We have about 25 entrepreneurs working on different topics. Oyster restoration is one that we ended up doing a new discovery for and did some anthropological work there to cultivate that group. Storied fish, it's a group of folks who are working on how do we tell the story of fish and make that so dynamic and appealing that we're required to assemble the data to tell that story. Traceability technology, fixing all those issues we were discussing about fraud. Breakthrough aquaculture is about to be assembled, and then we're pulling together one, tastemakers and restaurants. We've had so much success with this model. We are tracking to be, by April, 80% covered by revenues as opposed to grants from programs. And as a result of that, we've decided this actually applies to more than fish. This process could actually be applied to other complex systems. So we're in conversations now about looking at human trafficking or post-traumatic stress disorder as new complex systems to jump into. I'm going to skip this because I'm running low on time, but if you come see me at some point during the day, ask me about why I don't work with people who suck. <laughs> So, here's what you're looking for, which is the outcome. I'm going to tell some stories from some of our entrepreneurs. This guy is Tom Kraft. He owns a major, large seafood distribution company. And he has an unusual profile for someone in this industry. He used to be an auditor. And so he actually knows how numbers work, how different industries work. And he looked at the transparency in his company and he said, this is ridiculous. I can't even close my books until a month after I'm out from that moment in time because my tracking and inventory is so terrible. So he built his own system. As a result of having better tracking of fish, he now reduced his overtime cost by 80%, his cost of goods by 3%, and he's serving as a model for us to start to show the seafood industry that the upside of better technology is better than the upside of fraud. Steve Vilnet is actually employed by the state of Maryland. He works for the Department of Natural Resources there. And his sole job is to help fishers sell their fish for more money. And in doing that, he's managed to take four different species that were getting less than 50 cents a pound and get them up to ridiculous levels for the fishers, which is great for them. And they're all sustainable fish. So he's kind of proving in action this idea that consumers are willing to pay more for story, chefs want more story, and fishermen, if they can compare story with quality, then they wind up with uh, a great incentive to behave in a way that is in alignment with the, with the environment. One of his uh, pieces was contributing to getting rid of invasive species in Chesapeake Bay. So one of the invasive species is called a snakehead fish. It's from Asia. It's an exotic fish. It's, an, it's not supposed to be in the waterways here. But somebody with an aquarium let their fish go in the, in the waterway. And these fish reproduce at 50,000 young in one swoop. And they protect their young, unlike most fish. So it's everywhere now. And these things are top predators. They're very hard to catch. And there was, no fish, there was no fishery for them, and there was no market for them. So Steve pulled together a group of fishers, and they went out to try to figure out, how do we fish this thing? And it turned out that it was so resilient of a fish, um, they caught one, and then Steve made the mistake of picking it up by its gills, and its gills are serrated. There's barbs in there, so that one wasn't going to work. And the fish, he put it in the cooler. It flipped around so violently, it flipped the top off the cooler, flopped back in the water. He, it did the same thing when he eviscerated the next one for 20 minutes. So by then the flesh was so bruised you wouldn't be able to eat it anyway. So finally they figured out the way to catch this fish was with a bow and arrow. So you go out at night with a flashlight and you shine it on the water and their eyes light up and then you take your shot. And there are different uh, prices for a headshot versus a body blow. <laughs> but this fish now sells on the sushi market for $23 a pound, helping fishermen actually fish out an invasive species. That's the power of story. This is Barton Seaver, who is a professional chef. He used to have a restaurant in DC. He was one of the first chefs in the world, and particularly in this country, to really focus on sustainable seafood. And his policy was, I'm going to sell what comes in from the ocean, working with local fishers. And so he has this great story about um, one day this box shows up of fish, and he opens it, and there's this small bony fish in there that he's never seen before. And he's an expert. So he had to pull his almanac off the shelf and, and look it up. He still couldn't find it. So he called the distributor and said, what's going on? The distributor's like, I'll call the fisherman. I'll call you right back. So he called back. He said, 
So it turned out that it was a bad day on the water, and he didn't catch anything. So he sent you the bait. <laughs> so the fish was called flying fish. It's an incredibly bony fish, very hard to fillet, very little meat on it. And Barton's like, "All right, this is what I'm serving tonight." So he made it into this gorgeous appetizer, sent the plates out into the into the, the restaurant, and he told the waitstaff, "Tell everybody it's bait. This is the nature of a wild harvest. Sometimes you don't catch anything." And he sold out of that dinner twenty-eight dollars a plate within four hours. The power of story. We've been working with Barton over the last four years to build his platform. So he is now a lecturer at Harvard, and he has a fellowship from the National Aquarium. And he also is working with us to build a chef curriculum for restaurants, so that we can look at this problem of sustainable fish through a culinary lens. Because chefs make decisions based on how things cook up, what they can get from their supplier, what's the cost of plate, and those are not anything that the environmentalists are concerned with or about teaching. So this program actually will distribute his、um, curriculum to about 40 cities in the next three years, working with chefs in major metropolitan areas. So then, I think one of the questions that I've had all the way through doing this work: Who do I have to be to do this work? Does who I'm being as I do this work actually make a difference in the work itself? Because this is a very different type of project than a typical design project. It's not a project. I'm still here. I'm still immersed in fish. Four years later, I've become a part of the system that I'm actually trying to affect, and that means that I have relationships with the players. They're not just subjects that we send anthropologists to observe anymore. It's also A difficult space to be in. I get hate mail on a regular basis from fishers.、Um, we, I have conversations all the time with marine biologists who don't understand how markets work and they hate our work. So it requires a level of emotional resilience and a level of presence that I think is interesting. I would say this work is up close and personal. You can't do it from a distance. I've sat with a 70-year-old fisher and watched him break down into tears. Over the fact that his son will not be able to take over the family business because the New England fisheries are collapsing, I've listened to marine biologists who fear that they are chronicling the obituary of the ocean instead of actually doing research. It's hard to be present with that, and the only thing I can say is that paying attention to it and knowing that designing who I'm trying to be in this equation and basing that on a long-term commitment and embedded state. Is the only thing that keeps me sane. So one of my entrepreneurs had a really bad week and called me and described this whole deal, going down the toilet,、um, was very upset. It happened at like 11 o'clock, which is when, always when these calls happen.、Um, and I talked him through it and talked him down, and we came up with a couple of fallback plans that we could start working on the next day. And the next day, I also got online and I found a place to get this pillow embroidered. And I mailed it to him, and I put a note in there for his wife. I said, "The next time he's freaking out, bash him over the head several times with this pillow, and just remind him we're not going anywhere. We're here for the duration." I showed you this slide to contextualize how I think about design, and I would say that maybe I would edit that to say it looks like this. If you're going to be an embedded ally, everything has to be held in this context of deep empathy. Everything has to be done with this idea that you've become part of the system that you're critiquing. And you become part of the system that you are trying to change. So the third reason I'm still here, other than the invitation and having fallen in love with complex systems, is that once I got into the system, I found that it needed me, not because I'm so terribly unique and I'm the only one who could do this work, but because the talents that I have—storytelling, listening, empathy, a thirst for solutions—any of this sound familiar, designers? Were in scarce supply in this system. It was as if there was a shell-shaped hole in this sector that I could step into, and it felt like answering a call. So I'd invite all of you, as you ponder your journey trying to find the U-shaped hole in the universe, I would invite you to think about whether that might come from not thinking about what you need from a job or what you need from the world, but what the world needs from you. Thank you.